Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. It's so exciting to see you all at our first live author event in so long. <laughs> Yay, thanks for coming. My name is Jennifer Cole, and I'm, the libra I'm a librarian here at the South Valley's Library. Now I would like to introduce Stephanie Gibson, Assistant Director of Nevada Humanities. Thank you so much, Stephanie, for um, bringing this wonderful opportunity to us, and thank you to Nevada Humanities. Thank you, Jennifer. Hi, everyone. Um, as Jennifer said, I'm Stephanie Gibson. I'm the Assistant Director with Nevada Humanities. It is such a joy for us to be um, with you today as well. Um, does anyone know about us as an organization? Do, do you guys sort of follow us? Okay, good. If you don't, um, we're at www.nevadahumanities.org. Um, we'd love to keep in touch with you, um, but we are absolutely thrilled to be here today as your state's affiliate for the National Endowment for, Huma for the Humanities, and our mission is to connect and transform communities by sharing and amplifying the stories, ideas, experiences, and traditions of the diverse people of Nevada. So today we're gonna do exactly that. Um, I want to thank the Institute for Museum and Library Services and the Nevada State Library for helping us fund this Nevada Reads program, the Nevada Reads in Your Library, which is a series of events throughout this year and next that will bring authors, artists, historians uh, into libraries across the state. So be on the lookout for more programs like this one. And today we have the pleasure of spending time today with author Kendra Atleywork, who is our 2021 Nevada Reads author. We have all been reading and sharing her work, Miracle Country, a memoir of a family and a landscape and we're so excited for to hear her read today please have your questions ready um, Kendra will be reading and we'll be talking with our moderator as well today um, and if you have your book here I know that Kendra would be really happy to sign it on your way out if you're interested in that as well so I want to introduce our moderator today Casey Bell Casey is an assistant teaching professor of English at the University of Nevada Reno and I was just saying to Kendra I love working with English professors because they ask like the best questions of authors and I think authors appreciate it too <laughs> she teaches classes in composition, publishing and editing, and creative writing. Her fiction appears in or is forthcoming in Cream, Cream City Review, New South, Read Magazine, The New Limestone Review, and Timber. Casey is the co-director of Girls Rock Reno as well, a music camp for self-identified girls, trans and gender expansive youth that offers music instruction, band coaching, and workshops on social justice, creative expression, and self-love. She's also the proud mother of a pug mix named Maud. And then, of course, I want to uh, introduce our author, who just drove up from Bishop this afternoon. Kendra Atleywork is the author of Miracle Country, and she's the winner of the Sigrav F. Olson Nature Writing Award and the 2021 Woman Writing of the West Willa Literary Award in Creative Nonfiction. Kendra received her MFA in Creative Writing from the University of Minnesota. Her writing has appeared in Best American Essays, The Washington Post, The Atlantic, and The Los Angeles Times, and she's the recipient of the Ellen Malloy Desert Writers Award. She now, of course, lives in her hometown of Bishop, California. So thank you so much for being here, Kendra, and I'll leave it to you guys. Thank you so much, Stephanie. Thank you so much to the library for hosting us. Thank you to Jen and everybody who's setting up. It's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you so much to all of you for coming out. This is my first event of this nature for this book, so I'm it, that's in person, so I'm thrilled to be here. I'm gonna do my best to smile at you through my mask. <laughs> if you're ever in doubt, just know that I'm smiling at you. <laughs> And I'm so excited to talk with Casey. I think I'll start just by reading and then we'll, we'll do some conversation and then um, I might read little snippets throughout and then we'll take your questions at the end. All right, I'm so happy that I'm not staring into the black hole of Zoom, you guys. <laughs> so I'm gonna read a little bit just from the opening of Miracle Country. And if you haven't read Miracle Country, it's a memoir about my family in the Eastern Sierra Nevada region, just four hours from here, uh, very similar climate. I have a strong affinity for Nevada and especially Reno. Um, you're the, the biggest hub, nearest hub for us, so we come to you for the airport, for Costco, for the mall. <laughs> it was a thrilling place when I was a teenager, and it still is. <laughs> so I'm gonna read a little bit about um, just what it means to be from the Eastern Sierra, um, what it means to be from a desert, um, and, and how I feel like this kind of landscape and this kind of place that we all call home is sort of distinct 
um, in all of the country and sort of defines our experience. So this comes from the very beginning of Miracle Country, uh, early on in the first chapter. Fire happens often in California during summer, the driest months. Strange, my father thought, to see smoke over the valley in February. But this was a drought winter, absent of the snow that usually covers small meadows and stops just above the Owens Valley floor. My father parked the pickup outside our house beside the rounds of wood he had chainsawed and rolled into a trailer when a pine fell. And he split logs for an hour until the sheriff, Joe, came by and said everyone in Swall had to evacuate, that there was a fire seven miles down the mountain and no one knew which direction it would go. Pop told Joe, one more minute, I've just got to grab some kindling. And Joe chuckled and said, hurry up. My father went into our house and he gathered the photo albums and some jackets from the closet in the mudroom, passing by the painting of two trees leaning into each other over a stream, the wooden salad bowls that were a wedding present, the stacked cassettes of flute and fiddle music, Joni Mitchell, Cat Stevens, that my mother had loved. He threw the jackets and the photo albums on the back seat of the truck and he drove down the mountain. He didn't really believe Swall Meadows would burn. He'd planned to move the photo albums to his house in Bishop anyway, otherwise he might not have grabbed even those. Had he believed the house would burn, he would have called me before he was already back in Bishop, watching the mountainside from the valley floor. Had he called me sooner, I would have told him to get my mother's t-shirt printed with, with wildflowers, take the pictures off the walls, save the soft toy frog she gave me when I was small. The wind became more and more a wild thing as the sun moved west toward the ridge of Wheeler Crest. In Owens Valley, the wind gusted to 70 miles per hour, to 90, to 100, shoving cars across the highway and pitting windshields with blown sand. Anyone who lives in the Eastern Sierra knows this wind and its moods. On the beaches of the Pacific, gusts arrive laden with salt spray, whooshing with enough force to make your eyes water, a persistence perfect for launching kites. By the time that breeze reaches Owens Valley, it has raced over the coastal range, up the western windward flank of the Sierra Nevada, and it has turned powerful. Dust devils tear up the dry surface of what was once Owens Lake, tossing toxic particles miles into the sky, into the lungs of the people who live near the old shoreline. The wind blows from the west over the mountains and the willows along the river lean east. It scatters pollen in a golden film over backyard ponds. It stretches curtains across bedrooms. When a cold front moves off the Pacific, wind hurtles over the crest of the Sierra Nevada faster than a hurricane. In Bishop, it splinters pine boughs, shatters windows, breaks the little airport's wind speed indicator. Wind this wild is called the Sierra wave, and it tumbles over the valley like a wave breaking. I have hiked on a day when the Sierra wave pummeled the sky, have leaned into a gale so strong it negates the work of gravity, and I can almost lie down on air, can fall forward without really falling. I have found myself caught in a canyon when the Jeffrey Pines above me thrashed their branches like furious giants and the wave hurled stones and pine cones and I ran for my car. While my father drove south toward Bishop, this wind fanned what was no longer a small brush fire up the mountain. To understand the place we call the Eastern Sierra, you must be able to see what is no longer here. See what hides. Change your definition of big and empty and small, of good and bad. Bend and search the desert floor for the near invisible petals of a crowned mulia, and then look up to mountains that seem to rise forever. This dusty margin of California draws and then replicates the kind of people who have never completely adjusted to a human scale. They don't quite fit other places, be it the orbit of their ideas, good and bad, or the size of the sky they require in order to carry out their lives. The author Mary Austin wandered west from Illinois in 1888, fell into the California desert, and remained for a long time. She wrote of the place, you'll find it forsaken of most things, but beauty and madness and death and God. I walked around Swall Meadows after the fire and it was not the same. 
I looked from my bedroom over the old view, the ridge of Wheeler blackened and in places still smoldering. I could not arrange myself anywhere in Swall so that my field of vision did not include evidence of fire. But once the smoke cleared from the valley, the days after the burn were perfect blue and warm. We were first evacuated when I was too young to remember much besides snow lying over the mountain and burying our driveway, my father pushing the snowblower, the plume drifting over his shoulder like the tail of a white bird. That February, 20 years ago, we drove to Bishop in case of avalanche, which had swept houses off foundations in decades past. I had evacuated for wildfire before, too, but that was in July. Beautiful country burn again, wrote the poet Robinson Jeffers in 1926, words that have become famous in California. Swamp Meadows marks the border between desert and sky. Mostly the mountain is dry, the valley brown, but meadows spread to the west where my brother and sister and I used to roam. There, rose hips grow thick enough to tear denim, and a grove of water birch and willow hugs a snowmelt creek. Years ago, my father discovered a clearing beneath a roof of leaves, water running over crumbled granite. Grasses on the banks were flattened by the sleeping weight of mule deer or mountain lions. We called the place the Fairy Glen, and on summer afternoons, we walked there with mom to make mud balls and grass crowns and to pan for fool's gold in the cold water. Pop bent green water birch branches into our hands, let go, and we launched 12 feet into the air. With my friend Daniel, I pulled the tailgate off an old truck burned in a fire in the 80s and abandoned to the brush. We dragged the tailgate to the Fairy Glen and laid it as a footbridge across the stream. After the fire, Daniel wrote to see if my house was okay. He grew up 30 minutes northwest in another in eastern Sierra town deeper in the mountains called Mammoth Lakes. Now he lives in a wet green place and works with trees. Sometimes he wants to move home. Then he thinks better of it. California is going to get really scary, I think, he said. Crazy how things change in a decade, fires in February. Beautiful country burn again. I told Daniel what the Fairy Glen looks like now, mostly gone, my hand ghostly against the blackened trunch, trunk of a water birch. Walking the neighborhood, I saw women and men standing on driveways in front of warped water heaters, half-melted sewing machines, skeleton motorcycles, a spiral staircase leading nowhere. It's not if it's gonna happen again, a volunteer firefighter told me. His house, once resting beside poplar trees across from ours, had vaporized. He watched it burn as he fought the fire, saw flames spilling into the street as his fire truck rumbled toward his driveway, thought, no, then turned his back and went on to other houses. It's not if, it's when, he said. It might be 30 years. We could lose twice as many houses next time. A pause, smoke drifting from a hot spot on the mountain. Not to remind anybody of fire season when it's just ended. <laughs> but and now I would love to answer some questions from Casey and then from the audience. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Thank you for that beautiful reading. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here. This is a really beautiful, um, powerful book, um, as I'm sure all of you had the same experience I did reading. I was so struck by Kendra's lush and clear and beautiful writing. Um, so this is, this is a real treat. Um, so I wanted to start sort of broadly um, and ask you sort of why memoir, you know, right? Because um, there are so many different options for telling the story. Um, and your story is obviously very worthy of being told. It's so specific. It's so unique. It's so special. Um, how did you know that, that this was supposed to be a memoir? And are there things that you think memoir can maybe do that other, that you know, maybe novels or other, other types of nonfiction maybe can't do? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and again, oh. I've never been asked that question of <laughs> all the Zoom talks, so this is very exciting. Um, thank you, you were right, the English people. Are, are questions. So why memoir? Well, the easy answer, and probably the most true answer, is that I, when I first started writing this, was bad at fiction. <laughs> um, I, I tried writing fiction as an undergrad before I knew what creative nonfiction was. 
And I was having a very hard time with plot. All I wanted to do was describe my neighborhood. <laughs> and not, I was having trouble driving things forward. And I was also fixated on certain, I was fixated on this place that I had left behind. At that point, I had no intention of going back. And I, I was sort of, I did try writing some fiction about it, but it felt, it didn't, it just, it felt like the best description I've ever heard for writing outside of the genre that a book wants to be in is it felt like riding a bicycle with square tires. It just wasn't working. And I think, I think it just needed to be the real story. If I was a different writer, maybe I could have pulled it off as, as a novel, but it felt, it felt like it needed, I was writing it, it was the product of my 20s. So it, it was happening to me while I was writing it, for one thing, and it just needed to be nonfiction. It needed to be my actual family members, and the research also was really important to me, and I could have woven that into fiction, but it just felt, it was playing into my own life so viscerally, the drought and the fire, that nonfiction just felt like the germane genre um, for this book. Um, so a another thing I was really struck by was the structure of this book. Um, you know, rather than moving through time in a linear way, we're sort of, you know, moving back and forth, zooming in and out, um, and, and really place more than time seems to be the organizing principle. Um, and you even mentioned in the last section, you say, uh, when you're talking about the Numu creation story, which is so beautiful, um, that consciousness revolves around place instead of chronology. Um, and we see that in this book. So I'm, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the structure here and you know how you ultimately decided that all of these kind of different puzzle pieces fit together. Yeah, another great question. So the structure was the hardest thing to pin down. But at the same time, I always knew, at first I thought I, was, I wasn't gonna even have myself in the book because that seemed intimidating. I actually thought I was writing a research nonfiction book about a place. The more I wrote, the more I realized, I always knew I was gonna have the place first and foremost, and the family sort of rose and began to be equally dominant. Um, and when I think about my family and our experience, we would be unrecognizable to ourselves if it weren't for the place where we come from. So it was impossible to tell one story without the other. And then it was just a matter of figuring out the pacing and how to sort of distribute the different parts throughout this, the narrative arc, which I was experiencing as I was writing it. I was making the decision to move home. I was flying home to sift through the ash with the neighbors after the fire. This was all happening. And once I had that arc pinned down, which was a homecoming story, then I was able to take the larger pieces, the pieces about history, other communities in my home region, um, the indigenous people, the water transfer, everything that had gone into shaping that place and by extension shaping me and my family, then I was able to just distribute it along this uh, backbone of, an, of a story of an arc, which doesn't follow a chronology as much as an evolving relationship to a place. Um, and whenever you want to jump in and, and read a section, please. Okay, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, so my, my next question is about kind of all of the different voices in this, in this book. Um, and that's one of my favorite parts about it is that it's obviously rooted um, in your family's story, but there, it's, you know, there are a lot of other people's voices um, that you sort of hand the mic over to. Um, and the one that I was sort of most fascinated by was Mary Austin. Um, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about why, why Mary Austin, when we think about all of the different people who have written about the West, um, I, was, I was so intrigued about her. So, so how did you learn about her? How did you research her story? And what about her kind of spoke to you and, and made you know that she needed a voice here? Yeah, so Mary Austin, I wasn't familiar with her actually until I went to college. And then I was introduced to her by a college professor and I was like, wait a second, we're reading this book in my class in LA. I'm from there. <laughs> and, and that was really exciting. And I entered into, I never imagined I'd write a book in which she fe featured so prominently, but I entered into a dialogue with her over the next decade. And she just needed to be in the book because she, in many ways, she is a kindred spirit to people to this day that live in places like where I come from, places like the Eastern Sierra, who have found something in a harsh landscape, maybe in a 
place that is difficult to live, that keeps them there. There's maybe fewer limitations um, socially, culturally, They're, they feel freer. She was a, she's often called a maverick. And even now, there's a woman in my town who is a Mary Austin impersonator. <laughs> she, will, she and I have done events together where she'll dress up as Mary Austin and I interview her. <laughs> we interview each other. So her spirit is very much alive in that place as sort of a, a woman who was unable to live constricted by the social parameters of the late 1800s, early 1900s. So she, she has also an interesting way to better understand my mom. So part of, the, part of the goal of the book, or one of the themes of the book, is my, my struggle to know my mom, who died when I was 16, who I didn't get to know as an adult. But, I, but what I did have of her was her relationship to, the, to this place, because she and my dad had both moved to the Eastern Sierra. She was from Michigan, so she came from a very different place. They met there. They were both drawn by this place. And I distinctly remember her telling me, OK, you know, you've got to you got to come in at dusk because you're going to be hunted by something if you don't. <laughs> and she sort of taught me how to navigate the world through teaching me how to navigate the place that they had chosen to be our home. And Mary Austin felt like a parallel character to her um, for a in a lot of ways because my mom had sort of, she was a teacher as well, and she sort of raised her children to be a little bit, um, we were weird <laughs> in our school for sure. We were, for example, we were taught that if, if someone's ever trying to kidnap you, you don't scream, you roar, roar like a mountain lion. <laughs> so we were these little girls that would roar <laughs> and practice our roar. And so she felt like a kindred spirit to Mary Austin and Mary Austin helped me understand her. I love that, what a beautiful answer. And this, this is a good segue into my next question. Um, which is about the ways that you were raised. And you write so beautifully about um, the sort of strangeness of your family. And there's, there's such a nice quote. You write, every family cultivates a culture and lives by its own strangeness until the strangeness turns normal and the rest of the world looks a little off. Um, and by the way, I think all little girls should be trained how to roar. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm wondering kind of what your unconventional upbringing and your family life, like what did that give you as a writer and, and what did you take away from that that you put into your work now? Yeah, um, well I hope all little girls have an instinct of how to roar if they ever need to, I think they do. Um, so my, we were, we grew up 30 minutes from a town, from a, from a, yeah, from the school, from a town, there weren't many other kids in our neighborhood, we were halfway up the mountain, uh, it was pretty isolated. In, in a lot of ways, it was a lonely childhood, but I think we made the most of that. Um, it, it's, if I think back to, sometimes I wish that I had taken more lessons as a kid and had more skills now, other than just writing, like, wish I'd done dance or learned an instrument better. But all I wanted to do was come home and be in the dirt and catch lizards and just be by myself outside. And I think that, I think it sort of helped me I hope be sort of a, a, a good thinker, or at least uh, be really interested in the challenge of doing hard thinking and thinking differently about stuff. That's always what I aspire to, even though it's hard to actually accomplish. And I think we didn't have TV. Um, we didn't really have, this was before cell phones, thank goodness, um, before social media. We really had to entertain ourselves. We really had to come up with our own um, worlds to inhabit. And I think that, that that fed directly into into me being a writer. I used to, I felt unprepared for college because for similar reasons that come from a very, very small school. And my prof I had a mentor tell me years after I graduated, yeah, that was kind of an advantage actually because you came in um, without having been taught how to think according to a system. So you were, you were able to pull in stuff from your reading and sort of craft your own approach to life. And while that made things hard at times, I think it was really helpful for being a writer. Um, so some, some more questions about the family. Um, both of your parents, but I think especially your father, are portrayed with these sort of like mythic proportions here. Um, and you know, both of them seem to have this enormous capacity for discomfort. Um, you know, your, your father sleeps in this um, broken down restaurant over a very harsh winter. Your mother volunteers to be buried in the snow for avalanche search and rescue training. 
um, what accounts for that? Like, how how did they get that capacity? And do you feel like you have sort of, or, you know, are you as good at being uncomfortable as they are? <laughs> That's another great question that I've never been asked. I would say my dad continues to just baffle people. My friend recently came to town. She said, how is it that your dad seems to be aging backwards? <laughs> so I think he's a lot tougher than I am. Um, he's certainly braver. He's always breaking. He's broken both his collarbones, falling over on his mountain bike and his, his motorcycle and his skis. So he, he's a lot more um, fearless than I am. And when it comes to being uncomfortable, I guess they felt like they wanted to live in this place and by extension they were going to have to be uncomfortable sometimes it was it was a trade-off my mom was on the search and rescue team because she thought you know that could be me i could be the one in need of being rescued and so i'm going to be on the search and rescue team and get i'm, I'm going to let them practice on me and bury me under the snow and find me with dogs and i think she saw it as a kind of reciprocity so a lot of their discomfort, I think, was a form of reciprocity with the place. Like you don't, um, you don't just live here and enjoy it. You also have to participate in what it means to be a community out here. And so for me, I guess discomfort. Well, I live in Bishop, so <laughs> I, I get to experience the extreme temperatures. Uh, but I think maybe discomfort for me has manifested more in. Uh, digging maybe more like intellectual discomfort and digging back into material that was hard to learn about both both personally and also some of the history that was hard to learn about that was painful to learn about that was painful to write about and put together and and, and sometimes to talk about so that's I think where the discomfort has has uh, played a part in my life um, so again more, more about the family here um, it's a very loving tribute to your family that comes across so clearly. Um, but as a person who has sort of like a fraught relationship with my own sister, I was, I was really interested in the dynamic between you and Kayla. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, has Kayla read the book? Um, what has she said about it? And also, you know, your father and Anthony have, have uh, members of your family read this um, and have they told you how they felt? And is this something that you were kind of nervous about when you were writing and, and kind of as this book was um, coming into the world? Yeah, so my, my, I'm very fortunate. My family's very generous. Everybody signed off on the book before it was published. I gave it to them, I said, whatever you want me to not put in there, I'll take out, which I don't think every, I don't think authors are obligated to, to do that, but I felt that I should. And nobody wanted me to change anything. My dad knew that I was writing it, and I interviewed him at length. Actually, a lot of the stuff in the book comes from interviews with all of them. The one person that I was most worried about was my brother, because he was going through his rough transition period, which at the time we didn't know how long it would last, it would be permanent, some of his rough years, while I was writing the book. And I was writing about it, and I felt weird, because our relationship was still kind of uh, damaged because of that. But he has since, since I moved home, he has just, he's a refrigerator repairman now. <laughs> he just, he's just very solid. So he had the opportunity also to read the book and also was very supportive and happy about everything and had come to the point where he could look back on his own story and say, yeah, that's, that's how it felt. And that's, you know, I, I do feel like I've come full circle. And he had the best, re he has the best reaction when I would ask him, are you sure I can put this in? Are you sure? I can? He'd say, whatever will sell books. <laughs> so, I'm very fortunate. But I will actually maybe, Please, I think yeah. I have a section about my sister marked that I can read. Because something that was so interesting about writing this book was also coming to understand the place from the perspective of my family members as well and how it had shaped all of us in different ways and how that the loss of our mom followed us through our lives in different ways and the, re and the relationship to our home followed us through our lives in different ways. My brother and I still live in our hometown and my sister comes back as often as she can, sort of spends half the year there most of the time. So I'm just gonna read a little bit, a short section about my sister. Uh, this is from when we're both living in Los Angeles when we're like, like 18 or something. There were things we both missed, Kayla and I, and things we remembered, which we could not yet discuss. There was a sense of trudging forward 
as Kayla's friend had one night years ago, lost in sand dunes toward what we didn't know. Beyond Kayla's apartment loomed the Griffith Observatory, a giant white building, golden domed on the slope of Mount Hollywood. The observatory looked over downtown and when the smog blew clear, the ocean. Inside, projectors cast constellations on the walls. And you might catch a view of the stars, or so we were told. We could have climbed Mount Hollywood together and searched the night sky, looking for stars wheeling to their stations. We might have found an ocean with no monster. The fear of what we might not see kept us away. I have not forgotten the evenings we passed, peeling foil from burritos on her stoop, wringing the juice from limes, cruising the flea market for matching pairs of red sandals. I remember waiting in line to buy groceries at midnight and staring at oceans of bumpers on the 101. For a while, we were alone together outside the world of family or childhood, and we saw each other differently. Perhaps the city was a better counselor for us than our mom's friend had been long ago. And maybe this new almost closeness was simply the product of time, of waking one morning and no longer being 16. If I spent years clawing towards sunlight from the bottom of a dry well, that summer I looked over the edge for the first time and saw my sister. I saw my sister and I saw her pain. She rolled off her pillow, lit her bong, and filled the studio with smoke. Afterward, it seemed, time and distance telescoped. The green bowls her boyfriend gave her smelled almost like sap or sage. When she burned them to ash, the miles between that apartment and the house on Mountain View Drive could no longer be measured. The years between her and our mother's story of wildflowers dissolved. Time turned to water through which she could almost wade. That was beautiful. Thank you. Um, so zo zooming out a little bit, um, I know that you know in the acknowledgments, you, do you talk about um, sort of your your uh, time frame, and that this was a six year project that went into this book. Um, so can you talk a little bit about? what that process was like and like what those six years looked like in terms of balancing the actual writing and the research like how did how did this look for you yeah so i was in grad school for um, most of that or three of those years and that was very helpful because your life is oriented around writing book and you're just studying 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 the art of writing all the time you're you're studying through reading um, i had a professor who said writing can't be taught but it must be learned and i thought that was a <laughs> As a teacher, you may relate. <laughs> I thought that made a lot of sense, and the way we learned was by reading very closely. So that was years of, of studying other books that were doing something similar to what I wanted to do, workshopping. I probably wrote a 1,000 pages that didn't make it into the book in the wow. end, um, just doing the research. It was a real pleasure. I really, it, it was such a privilege to get to spend that time. And then I moved, um, then I, Minnesota showers the arts with grants, which is really nice, so I stayed there for a while. And then I came back home and I wrapped it up and I did more interviews with people that I needed to flesh out things, make sure I did my due diligence on the sections that didn't involve me, specifically the history and the other communities. And uh, then, then we went out and published it. And then COVID came along, <laughs> but now here we are. <laughs> Um, and what are some of those other memoirs that kind of inspired you? So I have a list in the back of the book, which is handy to refer to for uh, my research, research and inspiration. So the books that really, um, really influenced me, I'll just name a few. One that helped me think about reciprocity was Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmer, which is a beautiful book that talks about the merging of indigenous ways of knowing with science of the Western world. And that she just had such a clear way of talking about reciprocity with a community and a home and a family, and you could extrapolate it to any group, that I found really helpful with how I was thinking about um, our relationship to place, an aspirational one that's hard to achieve, especially in our culture now. So that book was really influential. Uh, Richard Rodriguez is a writer who helped how I think about the West and how I think about California, and he also helped me um, from a craft perspective.
because he does this thing where one second you're in his mom's kitchen and he's eight and you can smell her coffee and hear the television and then the next second it's the 15th century and you're in a jungle and there's an explorer just any any he he doesn't he's not restricted by chronology and that was very freeing to me to think okay you know we're following an idea we're following a consciousness we're following a thought we're not just telling a story then, then this happened then this happened then this happened and for this kind of book being able to track an idea as it developed or a relationship to a place as it develops was crucial. If I had tried to tell the book chronologically, it would have fallen flat. In fact, I did once. I rewrote the thing as a chronological memoir, as an exercise. <laughs> and I ended up keeping a few paragraphs out of that. But it really lost a lot of its life force when I did it that way. And I knew it. I kind of knew it would, but I just wanted to see. So he was freeing and, and sort of not being constrained by time and just developing a guiding voice. So those, I would say, were two big ones. There were a lot of others. They're all in the back of the book. <laughs> Um, so after, you know, after this process of doing all of this research and all of the, the reading and the care and the time and the work, um, do you feel like your kind of understanding of the relationship to self and place changed as a result of writing this book? And, and what does it look like for you? Yeah, great question. Immensely, I would say. I, 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 in many ways, I wrote my way home. Mm -hmm. um, when I first started this book, I didn't know I would be moving back. It was kind of a secret dream that I had. And I would, I would mention it to people and they'd be like, what are you gonna do there? Like, why? <laughs> what are you gonna do there in your small hometown? Don't do that. I had someone actually say, don't waste your potential in Bishop. <laughs> so uh, I had to, of course, then go and waste my potential in Bishop. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the book kind of uh, emboldened me to move home and it also explained to me why I felt so drawn because I was so homesick I was so, I, th I feel like we all probably have places and times in our lives that haunt us in a way, and we spend a lot of our lives trying not to go back there, maybe not even a, a physical place, but an experience. And so for a long time, home was a place that I didn't want to go because it was the home, not only was it a challenging place to live, the way it's related to LA with the water and the economy, struggles, all those reasons, but also it was the home of all my hardest memories. And I had this kind of inexplicable pull that was drawing me back there that I fought for a long time. And I kind of had to write this book to be okay enough with what had happened at home and the loss that I remembered that I had to kind of live with way more viscerally when I'm there. Um, I had to write my way to being okay with that. And I'm really happy living where I live and I feel like I feel like there's a, there is tons of potential of living in our, our little, you know, our Western communities, whether it's Reno or whether it's a little Nevada town or whether it's a little California desert town. I feel like that's where the potential was for me, but I had to write a book for six years in order to realize that. Um, and, you know, along those lines, do you see yourself staying in Bishop long term? I mean, especially given the ways that the book explores the, way this, the ways that it's unsustainable, um, and kind of the, the brutal use of water and land that are required to live there. Um, I'm wondering, you know, it's, it's the, the mention of Mulholland here. Um, are we all a little bit Mulholland in living in the West? Um, are we both a product of our culture, but also are we complicit in this kind of brutality by living here? Yeah, that's a hard one to answer. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think about that a lot. I think I think I feel, you know, they say an environmentalist is somebody who already has their, their mountain cabin or something. <laughs> Sometimes I feel a little bit like that in the sense that, you know, I, I live in this beautiful place that happens to have a water source. And then, you know, there's a degree of resentment when that water is taken and used elsewhere. And I do recognize, you know, there's certainly a degree of hypocrisy in that. And it's been, it's been nice writing this book and hearing from people, especially from Southern California, who maybe didn't know where their water came from or maybe do, and, but they, they say to me, oh, you know, we try, to, we try to, when we use it, we try to be aware of that and we try to respect where it's come from and we really love the place where it's come from and we really want that place to, to flourish. So when I hear that, that makes me feel a lot better 
because then I feel like it's, you know, it's being appreciated and sort of that idea of reciprocity. And I try to keep that in mind myself too. Like I think, oh, I hate that I have to add to landfills in this place that I love so much. It, it's a constant tension that I think we all deal with when we love our home. But I guess I would rather have that tension than hardly notice that I'm a being living on the planet. Yeah, yeah nicely said. Um, so I have one more question. I want to leave um, time for audience members to ask some questions. Um, but but what's next for you? Can we expect another memoir? Or what is, what is next um, on your writing horizons? So I will answer that as well as the other half of your prior question, oh, okay, which okay. I just remembered, which was <laughs> where are you going to stay in Bishop? And the answer to that is yes. Okay. So I will be, I will actually just wrote a little thing for the Washington Post about a lot of my friends who are leaving the West because of the constant smoke and in some cases the constant evacuating. And I very much understand that decision, but I'm not gonna go and I'm, I'm not leaving because I've already established I can't live anywhere else. So we know that we're staying in Bishop. So um, I think I'm gonna keep writing little pieces that are, that are kind of spin off from Miracle Country for various publications. And I'm also gonna try to write a very different novel. So stay tuned. <laughs> And now we would love to take, thank you, those were absolutely no, wonderful thank you. questions. My, my absolute pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> thank you everyone, you've been a wonderful audience and now I would love to answer your questions and I will repeat the questions so everyone can hear them. Um, Kendra, I know your impact on Bishop and I'm wondering if you feel any obligation to sort of help the youth there connect with their environment the way you finally have encapsulated it in your book? Yeah, so the question is about connect, helping the youth of, of the Eastern Sierra and Bishop connect with their environment the way I did. Um, I think that, yeah, I think definitely. I, I haven't quite figured out the best way to do that since I don't have kids and I'm not a teacher in the primary or high schools. but. It is, it is on my radar, and I'm glad to be reminded of it, too, because I do think it's really important. I also think it's kind of necessary for kids to leave and then come back. Um, when, when, when you're in high school, at least in my case, you kind of just wish that you could go hang out in a mall and live in a hot topic. Um, but <laughs> So there's sort of that um, boomerang effect. But I have a lot of friends who've come back and who have also since learned that they really love the place and think it's really special. So I would love to contribute to other young people having that realization. I want to tag on to that too. Your piece in the Washington Post was just, it's heartbreaking and devastating because we all feel the same way. We all feel that way. And you know, what can we do about these wildfires and yeah. you know, the smoke that there, we're just here in Reno, you know? It was mm -hmm. an awful, awful, awful summer and mm -hmm. last year was too. And we love this place. So we don't want to leave. Yeah, yeah. The common is the communal grief over the wildfires. That's that's really that's really hard. I feel like at least we all share that, and at least it sort of draws to the surface that there are a bunch of people who really love these places and feel equally invested in them. So in that way, it can be kind of galvanizing. But it's also just really really hard and sad to watch places that we love go through this over and over again. And also when people feel that they might not be able to stay because of it and they're driven from their homes. This is one of the best books I've read in ages. It was so exciting to have you here. I had a couple months ago read this book in Houston for a book club. It's months you come back, but you might. And I was just really impressed with um, the, the juxtaposition of family story, place, and science. Uh, what was more challenging for you? Because you wrote very well about the hydrology and the, the natural environment and the scientific principles that drove people. Was that as challenging as writing about your family or in, different, in a different way? Great question, and thank you so much. Um, I'm glad you enjoyed the book. And I should mention, if you have a book club, you can Zoom me in. I'm happy to join your book club. Um, yeah, so I pestered a lot of scientists via email, <laughs> and people were very helpful to me in helping me understand I had a friend who is is a meteorologist, friends who are geolo uh, yeah, geologists, um, all kinds of different scientist people who I would say, 
And do I have this concept right? Can you read this paragraph <laughs> and help me make sure I have this concept right? So people were really generous. And I, I think for that reason, it was actually a lot harder to write the personal stuff. And I left it out. I kind of wrote it last. The, the second chapter in the book, Search and Rescue, which is about my mom, was one of the last things I wrote. And I wrote it under my agent, who's a very good editor, her encouragement. And I think it was, it was harder to go there so I avoided it, but it was necessary. So th that was kind of the hardest part, I think. Um, your book and you remind me of another uh, podcast I heard recently about another book that was written. It's called Root and Ritual by Becca Piastrelli. I don't know if you've heard of her. And um, she's in her 30s, and she talks about the need for connection. And it sounds like you had a need to connect to your mother and to your uh, hometown. And she gives, uh, the root is like studying the indigenous people and then food and uh, family and getting back to self. And I just, I haven't read the book, but I now want to read the book because <laughs> I see uh, a connection here between your book and what she's trying to do. Mm -hmm. And she, felt the need to connection because she's in her mid-30s and she grew up in the nuclear family and um, you said you were kind of rural and it was just your family and I, I see a similarity that, um, I don't know, I just wanted to point out and see if you had heard of this author or this book. I haven't, but it sounds like something I need to look up. It's Root and Ritual by Becca, Becca P. Estrelli? Yes. Okay. That sounds really good. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. And I do. Th I think the, the the need for the desire for connection is definitely at the heart. It's at the heart of so many books. I think it's just and 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 if that can happen through place and through a community, that I think it can be a great way to reach across the political aisle. And and yeah. So thank you. We'll look into that. Anybody else? I just wanted to mention, um, I love the way you wove so much in. Um, I'm from Southern California, then lived in Northern California, now here. But we knew about Owens Valley and the water. But you really brought that out, so it educated me. But what I want to say is that um, your brother Anthony, I mean, he's a different ethnicity th than you, and you um, had so much empathy, so much understanding, and that was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, he's he's just always been my brother. <laughs> so, but I but I did try to get into what it would have felt like for him to be, um, why he gravitated toward the native community and why that felt like a safe place for him when he was having a hard time as an adolescent. Poor kid, he keep, his families keep falling apart one after the other. So I'm really happy that he's doing well now. And I'm really proud of him. I really enjoyed your connection with Mary Austin. Uh, I found her fascinating to the point that I uh, borrowed her book from the library and I had never heard from her before. Uh, I really enjoyed your intermingling her stories with yours. Great, I'm so happy to hear that. I'm always really happy to hear when people have discovered Mary Austin after reading my book. I, I think, I, I hope she's read for, forever. <laughs> I really feel like she was ahead of her time. I just wrote a little thing, a little essay about this actually, where um, I feel like you have historical figures like Mulholland who are understandable in that they were, they had, they were given a task by the, by the culture that they lived in and they completed that task and they didn't, they failed to think outside of their moment in time in the sense that, you know, he didn't acknowledge the rights of the indigenous people, he didn't acknowledge the ecological damage of the removal of the water. And then you have people, and then you want to say, okay, I kind of cut you some slack because you were living in a different time. And then you remember the Mary Austins <laughs> and the indigenous people who had that reciprocal way of living already on lock and could have shared if they'd been asked. And you have people like Mary Austin who did do, did ask and did sort of, uh, she wrote something in the San Francisco Chronicle in 1905 saying, 
it is, is all of this necessary that Los Angeles should be just so big? And she's making this sort of, this statement against really un, uncontrolled growth that I think was rather unusual for that, that period and is still far from the mainstream way of thinking today. So I think she's a great example of how to, how it's very hard, right? I'm sure I fail at it all the time to think outside of the, the, the box that is my culture. And she's a great example of how to try to do that even if we do fail a lot. taken with your description of when you got the um, piercing in your belly button and the connection with your mother. As when you, is, is that something that you think about whenever you see your belly button that you know the connection of the of that through that part of your body she you know fed and nourished you to be born and then you did that Three, is it three weeks before she died, you had that piercing. And that was just really a wonderful description of how you described that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the, comment was, uh, the comment was about the belly button piercing that my mom took me to get. And if I still think about her in connection to that, and I do, I still have it. We won't do show and tell. <laughs> but I do still have it. And I do, I do think about her. Um, it was, it, my friend and I were just hell-bent on getting our belly buttons pierced at 16. We, would, we went to the local salon and we said, here's a note from our mom. That didn't work. So then we took her boyfriend. This is our brother. He's 18. He can, that didn't work either. Finally, my mom agreed. And she, yeah, I remember, I was so surprised that she agreed because that was not her type of thing. And she, she kind of broke down afterwards and she said, I, I, I let you do this because I want you to remember me. And I just remember thinking, Mom, of course I'm like, of course I'm going to remember you. I think about you every five minutes, you know, <laughs> even though at this point, you know, she's been gone for half my life. And so that I remember that day when I when I think about that piercing. Yeah, it's strange to have a piercing have such sentimental value, but <laughs> it does. <laughs> I just wanted to mention that sometimes in the book, you, you, you have these mythical char characters, your parents, you watered them much. And then we hear that they played in the band, and you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> they were like that normal and grounded while, while also being so uh, mysterious, sort of? They're dorks. <laughs> the, co the comment was my parents uh, are, are larger than life, but then they, they play in the band. Yeah, they met in the symphony. My to, case in point, we had our Christmas parade in Bishop on Saturday, and my dad is in the local Rotary Club, and he, he leads the Cure Polio charge, and he rollerblades in a top hat. He's 6'8", he's on rollerblades, in a top hat with a sign, like, help Rotary end polio, and he leads the parade. He's the first person down Main Street in the community parade with everybody doing the fun run behind him. So they were total dorks. <laughs> he can bike really far and ski really fast, but he's, yeah. <laughs> I especially like this discussion at the airport. That for some reason, that really always stuck with me. His time at the airport, his management of the airport was just awesome. His relationship to flight has, has always been fascinating to me. And it's funny because he's so not, in many ways, he's so not introspective. Um, and he's, he doesn't understand poetry, per se. But get him talking about flight, and he becomes a poet. And I tried to get that language in the book. So all those, all those interviews with him are just verbatim from our conversations. And I, I really wanted to get that. That aspect of his voice, when he, he can be so articulate and poetic when he's talking, he doesn't even know that he is. <laughs> he doesn't know, I'm going like, oh my gosh, this is, <laughs> he doesn't even know it. It's just, it's just organic. I liked how he saved the family in the big air balloon, how he just kept his cool and figured it out. Yes, he, he, he's had a lot of close calls and <laughs> that hot air balloon story, <laughs> he loves to tell that and it, it, it ended well. <laughs> so 
of your family members, they all gave you permission prior to publishing to put it as you wanted. But after it's out there and there's been some time to process, how do they view it now? Are they still as okay as they were prior? Yeah, great question. Yeah, the question is the family's reaction now that the book's been out in the world. They're still very supportive. And the, the response, this, this event is a great example of just the generosity and love and support that so many communities have shown to us through this book. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, and my family, I think, has, I think they feel my dad, my dad said people will people who he kind of knows around town or even tourists will be like, hey, I know you, you're the map guy. <laughs> and, and people that he has sort of known but not really, they'll say, I know you now. And, and he's, he's like, people like to know, people like to know you. And he likes, it feels good to be known, I think. So I'm, I'm glad about that because they, you know, they took a risk to let me write a book about them. And I'm happy that they, it makes them feel more connected to their community. Well, you have a name that's very tied to your family, Alleyward. I mean, it's, it's nobody else has that name. Yeah, I've, I can't hide on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so easy to find all the, whether I want to be or not. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. This was such a pleasure. questions and I just wanted to leave it there on that sort of topic of love and I just think the the love you have for your family and what your family has for you really shone through in the book I think we can all agree and thank you so much Casey for your thoughtful questions and um, Kendra has about 15 minutes probably to sign some books if you'd like your book signed by her before she goes on to her next event this evening at Patagonia and um, thank you all so much and thanks again to the library for having us <laughs>